Continuing our study in the Gospel of John, we're now in John chapter 3, verse 7. This is a continuation of the Lord's conversation with Nicodemus. The Lord has challenged Nicodemus that he was thinking that his physical birth was sufficient so that he might enter the kingdom of God. The Lord says, no, you need to have a new birth, a birth from above, a new birth from the Spirit. So this is a continuation of that conversation. In chapter 3, verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, or you must be fathered again, begotten again. The Lord here seems to be scolding Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. Nicodemus was a leader. Nicodemus should have known the Old Testament very well and should have known that there was more than just physical birth involved. But the Lord does not explain how Nicodemus should have known this, from which verses. Or he, the Lord doesn't go into those details. Chapter 3, verse 8. The wind blows where it wants, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Thus is everyone born out of the Spirit. Now, there's some interesting things going on here. Wind here, the word is the Greek word is pneuma, can also mean spirit or breath. And the word translated here, sound, can also mean voice. So are we talking about the spirit blows where he wants and you hear his voice? Well, maybe not, because we don't really think of the spirit blowing here and there. So it does really seem like the Lord is talking about the wind, regular wind blows here and there, and, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. That seems to be what's going on here. But just remember that when the Greek reader read this about the wind or about the pneuma, the Greek reader had to think, oh, wind or spirit or breath. And here, yeah, wind. By the way, the same Three meanings appear in Hebrew. The Hebrew word is ruach, and ruach can mean wind or spirit or breath as well. Here in the second part of the verse, the Lord does draw in the issue of the Holy Spirit. Thus is everyone born out of the Spirit. Initial, the first half of the verse is about wind blowing, but it, it then the Lord connects it with thus it is that everyone born out of the, the Holy Spirit. So it is about the Holy Spirit, but it's also about physical wind. <laughs> well, Morris brings up Ecclesiastes 11.5, which says, As you do not know the path of the wind, or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. And there again, that same ambiguity between spirit and wind exists in Hebrew. So there is a strong connection with that verse and John 3, 8. Chapter 3, verse 9, Nicodemus replied and said, again, here's that idiomatic, Aramaic, Hebrew style of speaking, to reply and say. Nicodemus replied and said to him, how can these things be? Nicodemus is very confused. But the Lord knows that he has to hit him, so to speak, hard. Even though Nicodemus at the beginning of the conversation had seeds of faith, Rabbi, we know that from God you have come, a teacher. But these last words of Nicodemus in this conversation are not words of faith. These are the last words of Nicodemus recorded in this chapter. Of course, later Nicodemus appears defending the Lord Jesus before the Sanhedrin, and then at the end of the gospel, Nicodemus appears again going to the tomb. But here, Nicodemus is just confused, questioning, but questioning, questioning, asking, wanting more understanding. And then we don't read any more about Nicodemus here. He just, you might say, he fades into the background. We don't know quite when he walks away. It isn't noted. Well, chapter 3, verse 10. Jesus replied and said to him, You are the teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things. 
a thorough rebuke. The Lord scolded Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, for his lack of understanding. After these things have been explained to Nicodemus, he should have understood them, especially as the teacher of Israel, an expression that seems to refer to a position, well, that's no longer, we don't really know what position that might be, but it seems to speak of a very special status that Nicodemus had in Jewish society then. As, a, as the teacher of Israel who already taught the word of God, he needed to become ripe fruit ready for picking. He should understand that status and hard work do not bring people into the kingdom of God. Chapter 3, verse 11. Truly, truly, I say to you that what we know, we speak, and what we have seen, we testify, and you do not receive our testimony. Now, Greek verbs and pronouns show whether the you is a singular or a plural, but English doesn't show that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, singular, that is the Lord speaking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, I'm talking to you. That what we know, we speak, and what we have seen, we testify, we testify to, and you, now that you is plural. You do not receive our testimony. You do not receive, that's plural. Hmm, why did he shift to plural here? It seems like initially the Lord is talking to Nicodemus, but then he shifts over to you all, we might say, or you, all you Jews, or all the Jewish nation. And so here, the Lord seems to be addressing all Jews through their representative, the teacher of Israel, through Nicodemus. That seems to be what's going on in this shift from singular you to plural you. Nicodemus came to the Lord Jesus because the Lord performed such signs, and so Nicodemus was open to being taught from a teacher from God, this Rabbi Jesus. Nicodemus fails here, not quite because he didn't understand when he said, how can these things be, but because he was not willing to receive the testimony about the Lord Jesus Christ. He failed and he was rebuked because he was not yet ready to believe. Chapter 3, verse 12. If we speak to you of earthly things and you do not believe, how, if we were to speak to you of heavenly things, will you believe? There's a distinction here between earthly things and heavenly things, and it's a little bit difficult to, for us to understand what are the earthly things. It seems like being born again or fathered from above is an earthly thing, that has already been spoken to Nicodemus that he didn't understand. So how can we speak to you of the heavenly? This is a little bit difficult, but it seems like the need for people to be born again is an earthly thing. And even that Nicodemus doesn't understand. He hasn't even brought up the heavenly things like how the holy God can give eternal salvation, forgiveness of sins to sinners. It seems like the things that the Lord is going to say here do answer Nicodemus's question of verse 9, how can these things be? They're the heavenly things which are even more difficult to believe. How can you believe my explanation? You haven't even accepted these simple things about being born from above. So from here onward, Nicodemus, not quite ready to believe or understand, he doesn't speak. And he's not mentioned until much later in the Gospel of John. So in effect, the dialogue between the Lord and Nicodemus has become a monologue. Chapter 3, verse 13. And no one has gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. The Lord Jesus here has already explained to Nicodemus that heavenly things are difficult to believe. But here he begins to explain not only that mankind must be born from above, but also the way that this could happen. How can these things be? The way this can happen through the redemption accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ on his cross. Only the Lord Jesus could possibly explain the heavenly things because no one has gone up into heaven except him. 
no one has witnessed the heavenly things and returned to earth to testify, except the Lord Jesus himself. He came down from heaven to explain about the heavenly things and also to make a way so that mankind could be born from above or fathered from above. In Proverbs 30, verse 4, there are some words quite similar to those of the Lord Jesus. Proverbs 34 says, Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. The author of Proverbs did not have the godly wisdom which one would have if one could actually go to heaven and learn there. Only the Lord Jesus has that kind of wisdom. In fact, in John 1.18, we read, God no one has ever seen, the only unique Son who is upon the bosom of the Father. That one has explained him. And how can he explain him? Because he's been there. The main purpose of Jesus coming down to heaven is explained in the following verse. Chapter 3, verse 14. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, in the same way it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. He came down from heaven because on this earth he must be lifted up. In this verse, the Lord begins to answer Nicodemus' Nicodemus's question from verse 9. He begins to explain the heavenly things here. He uses a figure of speech of the snake lifted up in the wilderness for his crucifixion. This is from Numbers 21, 4 through 9, which symbolized and anticipated the cross. This is the first hint in the Gospel of John about the actual cross of Christ, through which believers are given the right to become children of God. John emphasizes the similarities between the snake and the Lord Jesus, that both must be lifted up, but there are even more similarities, because the snake symbolized the sins of the people of Israel, and when he was crucified, the Lord Jesus took on our sin. Chapter 3, verse 15. So that everyone who believes in him might not be destroyed, but have eternal life. Now, there's a textual problem here. Some early Greek manuscripts don't include the words might not be destroyed, but they are there in some early manuscripts and the majority of the later the majority of the manuscripts, which are later. I think it's a part of the Word of God. So that everyone who believes in him might not be destroyed, but have eternal life. Now this word believe here, pistuo is the Greek of this word. Well, let's not change what the, this word means. It means the same thing in Greek as in English. I walk into church or a theater and I see a lot of chairs, for instance. And I sit in one, but I believe that they're all chairs. Well, when I walk into that church and I look at all those chairs, and I, I believe those are chairs. Now, that's faith. That's the issue of belief. I believe those are all chairs. Now, I only sit in one. And when I sit, because of my faith that this is a chair and not an illusion or a, a fake chair, when I sit in it, that's works. So let's keep those two things separate. Let's not, when we're talking about how to get into the kingdom of God, how to receive eternal salvation, when we're talking about things like, so that everyone that believes in him might not be destroyed, but have eternal life. Let's not confuse what this word believes here means. You believe, that's a, a, in your mind. You may say in your mind, in your heart. Okay. When you sit in a chair, that's working, doing something based on your belief. Well, here it's just believing. I believe that's a chair. I believe this is a pen. 
I don't have to write with it. I believe it's a pen, whether I write with it or not. I believe it's a pen. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins. That's faith, and that brings salvation. Now, I might act upon my faith that this is a pen by using it to write, or I might not. I might find a different pen to write with. That's a question of works, and works based on our faith in Christ, that's wonderful. That's how we become disciples, followers, obedient believers. That's great. But so that we are not destroyed but have eternal life, that's everyone who believes in him. Not everyone who believes in him and acts upon that faith by doing this or that or the other thing. No. Gospel of John is very clear. Everyone that believes in him will have eternal life. Not believes and does something. That's not what the text says. And we need to guard that as we read and interpret the Word of God. The purpose of the mysterious expression, the revelation that the Son of Man must be lifted up is now explained. Eternal life for everyone that believes in him. What Nicodemus must do is explained. There's no doing. There's just believing in Jesus Christ to enter the kingdom of God. We already read, but as many as received him, he gave the, them the right to become children of God. To them that believe in his name, those not from bloods, nor from the will of flesh, nor from the will of man, but from God begotten. In his conversation with Nicodemus, the same theme is developed. The term become children of God is used in 1, 12 through 13, and also in the conversation with Nicodemus. Here we read about having eternal life, and it's the same idea. The condition believes in him or believe in his name, it's in both texts. That's the way to gain eternal life. So with these words, it seems like the conversation with Nicodemus is over. The Lord has wrapped up that conversation and then it's debated, but it does seem like 316, in 316, the narrator, John, takes over. We'll talk about that in our next lecture.